just want to take an opportunity to uh, welcome you all and to thank you for joining us this evening. I especially want to thank uh, a couple of people who are very, very involved in the planning of this uh, program this evening. First of all, this evening could not have happened without the incredible efforts of many and Aaron Stadler. So, it also could not have happened without the amazing technical assistance of Dr. Yossi Pinsker, who's in the back. The organization skills of Stephen Rosen, who oversaw all of the logistics that made this event happen. And in particular, a tremendous, tremendous thank you goes to the Jewish Educational Center and its main office, uh, Rabbi Pinchas Shapiro, Rabbi Heitz, of course, but um, in particular, Steve Karp, who's been out here three times today just to make sure every detail was taken care of, Rafi Nairin, who also saw all the home-based logistics, and of course, the maintenance crew led by Batsalo. This event is an event that really brings out all the goodness of our community, and I thank the JC and its main office for all of their assistance in helping us make uh, take care of all of our needs. I also want to just quickly remind you, it's not only Wednesday nights that we have wonderful programming. Tomorrow evening we are again continuing with our partnership with the JC uh, in our Thursday night uh, free Shavuos Kaburish series, uh, currently entitled Kabbalah Satora, All Ages and Stages, and they are featuring the best of the talent of our yeshiva system. Tomorrow evening we will have a chance to hear from Rabbi Ami Newman, who is the Manal of RTMA, who will be speaking on Birchah Satora and Mashiach. And it's of course open to all ages, stages, genders, everybody is invited to attend. And having heard Rabbi Newman here in the building before, he's somebody you don't want to miss. Zakor Yemos Olam Vinu Shnos Tor Vador. Remember the days of old. In each and every generation, no generation. Shal Avicha V'Yagetcha Zekeinecha V'Yomrulach. Ask the earlier generations, ask your fathers, ask your elders, they will teach you. Chazal learned many, many valuable lessons out of the process of Shal Avicha V'Yagetcha Zekeinecha V'Yomrulach. Ours is not just a religion and a tradition that begins in the current generation. Ours is a religion and a tradition that gets its strength from knowing where we come from and all of the stops along the way. And uh, the study of who we are and where we are, we couldn't be where we are if we didn't recognize the wonderful, incredible steps that it took to get this far. In the last 13 years, I've been privileged on an almost yearly basis to listen to the wonderful story of Dr. Bernie Shanzer. Almost yearly, he would get together and teach us, right before us, Arabitebes, about the importance of understanding a world that existed before there was an Elizabeth Kehillah, about a world that he was a very strong part of together with his brother. And for years, I would ask him to come back to share not only of his wonderful historical knowledge, but of his wisdom, which is always intertwined in everything that he does. In the same period in time, I've had the honor and privilege on a number of occasions to get to know Mr. Henry Shanzer, a man who, just like his brother, is a man filled with wisdom, but with incredible wit as well. Having won as a, as a speaker is a tremendous honor. Having two, I can tell you, is going to be a wonderful treat. And so without further ado, and in the spirit of remembering who we are and what makes us, I give you Dr. and Mr. Bertie and Henry Shantz. One of us has a microphone, the other one is a dummy. <laughs> I'm really the bad Philip Christ. <laughs> Some of you have heard part of our story, but we're going to repeat it and repeat it till you it becomes part of you. But our story 
our story. Just see. Louder. <laughs> they can't hear. If Mama cannot hear me, you're in trouble. <laughs> Thank you. Our story is a story of terror and survival from a child's perspective. We were seven years old when we were impacted by the shore. We testified as to a crime which was committed against our family and against humanity. However, we should never forget that it was a crime primarily against the Jew, that is, against each one of us. The intent of the Nazis' final solution was to kill every Jew, irrespective of age, gender, religious affiliation, or status. On August 26, 1942, our father, Bruno Schanzer, was put in a roundup of Jews in saint Etienne, France, and from there deported to Drancy, a detention camp outside of Paris. As listed in the documentary of Glasspell, our father was on convoy 27 and left Drancy for the East on September 2nd, 1942. We have our father, and below that, and I will bring your attention to Elise and Henry Uzeleka, who were five and nine. They were alone, without parents, destined to be murdered. Henry and I could have been on that convoy. From that convoy, there were 1,016 1, people. At the end of the war, 30 had survived. In total from France, 75,000, 721,000 Jews were deported, and that included 11,000 children. At the end of the Shoah, 2,566 had survived. How did we survive? My twin brother and I, my sister and cousin, survived due to the fact that they were righteous Gentiles who were hidden children, and the righteous Gentiles, as well as our blessed mother, were vital in causing us to survive. The people who we recognize as righteous were Jean Bonhomme, we called Catan Jano, or Anne Jane, her mother, Adolphine Dorel, whom we called Meme, or Grandma, and also more recently were added the Marquis and Marquise de Virieux. And our story is not complete if we do not remember them and praise them. To put our story uh, and that of our family in perspective, note that uh, our mother Bella was born in Poland and our father Bruno was born in Czechoslovakia. Our mother came from a very traditional background and this is a picture of our maternal grandmother. <coughs> our father came from a more liberal background and ironically, my father's father, Bernhard Schanzer, after whom my brother Bernhard's name was killed in World War I, fighting for the Orkneys. Our parents immigrated to Belgium in the early 1930s when they met. They were married in 1932, and we show you a copy of their marriage certificate. And we show you this certificate 
to prove to you that we were and are legitimate. <laughs> my sister Anna was born in 1934, and my twin brother and I were born in 1935. We lived in Liège, Belgium, which is north of France. Uh, this is a this is a photo taken of uh, my brother and me and my sister, my father and my mother. And on this picture, we don't know who is the dummy and who is the ventriloquist. <laughs> we and this was this picture was taken just about three years later or four years later, 1939. And this is. Uh, Bernie and I, we suspect we know who it's with by this time, and our sister. Now, we show you these photos so that you can see that by our own admission, we once were very cute, <laughs> and you can understand why our mother loved us. <laughs> but we show you these pictures to underscore the cruelty and inhumanity of the subhumans who plan to harm and kill such innocent and angelic children. Our ordeal began when the Germans invaded Belgium on May 10, 1940, and this is the New York Times uh, banner headline uh, reporting that event. Within a few days, 15 members of our extended family <coughs> crammed into a small van, and we fled ahead of the advancing Germans towards France. My first experience with the horrors of war occurred as we were fleeing towards the French border. German planes began to strafe our convoy and the town we were approaching. Those of us who were able to do so jumped out of the van and took cover on the side of the road. As the planes flew by, we saw cars, buildings, and people being blown up into the air. After the bombing, we continued to travel to the south of France, just ahead of the Germans, and uh, we eventually settled in uh, the city of Saint-Étienne, Uh, in uh, late summer of 1940. From the fall of 1940 until the summer of 1942, I have no recollection of our <coughs> children's world being threatened. We even managed to go on a family vacation to the countryside, and this is a, the picture of the happy family at that time. On that same, on that same holiday, there's a picture of the three of us, and this is obviously Bernie's on all the way to the right, my sister and me. But I want to, you to observe very closely what the picture shows. See who took the long sleeve shirt, the good belt, the good shoes, and left me with a short sleeve shirt, the lousy belt, and the holy sneaking. And that's been the story of my life. Now, as to our family's involvement in things Jewish, I'll tell you two stories, and if you're interested, you've got many more. But to begin with, shortly after we settled in Saint Etienne, our parents hired a Hebrew teacher to try to teach us some Hebrew. However, we took an instant dislike to him, and as he was leaving our apartment building, we went out on the balcony overlooking the street and pelted him with wet paper towels. That was the end of our Hebrew lessons. But our father, who was a strict disciplinarian, administered a different lesson to our little behind. Uh, uh, another recollection, and this must have been on Yom Kippur, and the 
uh, in, in Saint Etienne, the women's section was in a balcony above, overlooking the, the men's section, and my mother had a seat all the way up front near the Aron, and my brother and I would run every five minutes to get some food, and all the old ladies would complain about our constantly disturbing them from their davening. Almost like the shoe we have today. <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, any degree of normalcy came to an abrupt end in the summer of 1942. Saint Etienne was in Vichy, France, and although Vichy, France was not under immediate German control, the French government and police participated actively, willingly, and intensely in the arrest and deportation of Jews. To their shame, the French did not officially acknowledge their role in aiding the Nazis until 1995. In July of 1942, my parents had sent Bernie and me to a summer camp. We came home from camp in early August 1942 to find the atmosphere tense and supercharged. There was a palpable sense of gloom and doom. Years later, we learned from our mother that many stories were circulating about German atrocities. Our father, who had been educated in Germany, did not believe that the so-called civilized Germans could, could possibly behave in the manner being reported. Our mother, who had been raised in Poland, and subjected to virulent anti-Semitism from her earliest days, feared the worst. Unfortunately, our parents and the other members of the extended family opted to stay in Saint Etienne. In mid-August 1942, a few days after our, after our return from Cannes, our parents told us that they would be sending us off to be boarded in a farm with a friend, an acquaintance that my father had made. Our sister was going to be going to a school in Lyon. And Henry and I have etched into our, mem our memory the following day when our father took us to the bus depot and he was carrying our suitcases and we were walking along beside him trying to help. And we got to the bus depot, we sat down, and our father reminded us once more that we had to be on our best behavior, and that we had to act as big boys. At that point, he took us, each one on the lap, and suddenly, everything started shaking. And Henry and I, we were alarmed and suddenly our father was crying. The bus came, our father rapidly composed himself and he helped us get on the bus. And this was a picture of, of our father. He was 39 years old, we were seven and a half. We were never to see him again. We got on the bus and after a short ride, we arrived at the farm where we were going to be boarded. Henry and I cannot remember the name of that person, but we called him Monsieur Chrétien. Monsieur and Madame Chrétien. After we had been on the farm for a few days, our mother came to visit. And we had a lovely day together, then we walked her back to the bus depot. And as she was waiting for the bus, there was a French policeman who came around and was asking people for their papers. When he came to my mother and he saw her papers, he told her that she was wanted by the police in Saint Etienne and he was going to go on the bus and accompany her back. My mother reassured the policeman that she had done nothing wrong, that the moment she got back to Saint Etienne, she would go directly to the police station, straight out the matter. There was an appropriate exchange of money because my mother was a strong believer in the power of the purse. 
and the policeman let her get on the bus. Our very resourceful mother got off the bus a couple of stops before the last stop in Saint Etienne, leaving her luggage on the bus, and she went to our apartment, and it had already been seized. On that fifth uh, fateful day, August the 26, 1942, she learned that our father, his brother Max, and uncle Boris I, our cousin Jack, and his parents, Boris and Frida Shapiro, had been arrested and deported. Except for our cousin Jack, who was taken off out of the camp by a cardinal, a French cardinal, the Cardinal Gerrier, they were all deported and murdered. After leaving our mother at the bus depot, we came back to the farm and we told Monsieur and Madame Chrétien what had happened. Our welcome to them, which had initially been cordial in that form, all of a sudden became very cruel. It seems that shortly thereafter, Monsieur Chrétien became very worried about having to the Jewish children, and he went to see a doctor, Dr. Farge, who was supposed to pay him for our care, and he asked for more money. Dr. Farge told him I would love to give him some more money, but I have to have the permission of the chances. My mother at this point was hiding and on the run. Our father had been deported. Monsieur and Madame Chrétien were very disappointed, and a few days later, Monsieur Chrétien told us, we are going to go on a trip. And Henry and I, we packed our bags, we carried our suitcases, we got to the bus depot, and when we got to the bus depot of the little town, the sign said, Saint Etienne. And we said, great, we're going home, we're going to go back and see our parents. But why did Monsieur Chrétien tell us all this? We got to Saint Etienne, and Monsieur Chrétien walked us to the police to a police station, handed us over to the police, and told us they will take very good care of you here. In the police station, that like, little criminals were in, were inter interrogated. They asked us, "Where is your mother? Where are our friends?" We did not very we didn't have very much to say, and. At that point, they told us, we are going to place you in an orphanage. You have been betrayed and deserted. The, the orphanage to which we were brought was a Catholic orphanage, which was run by kindly nuns who promised us that if we were good, we could become priests. We never made it. <laughs> the orphanage was across the street from a church to which were marched daily and twice on the Sunday for prayers. As part of our new identity, we were given a rosary to be used during our prayers. For those of you who are not familiar with the rosary, it is a set of beads which is used by Catholics when saying certain prayers. I don't know where my brother and I got the idea and or the courage to rebel, but when everybody would kneel on two knees, we would cheat and only kneel on one knee at a time. Also, when everyone else was carefully counting the rosary, we purposely skipped beads and we would mutter under our breath, God kill them, God save us, God kill them, God save us. <laughs> As an aside, and uh, uh, a good portion for our uh, remain for our age and sanity is the fact that having a twin brother provides you with a natural and <coughs> uncritical ally and allows you to do many outrageous things. We created our own world and reality, and by mutual agreement. Whatever we did became the normal thing to do. We had been in the orphanage for about two months when we experienced what Bernie likes to call the Great Escape. 
One morning, as we're walking from the orphanage to the church, two men approached us and said, we have a message from your mother tomorrow, stay at the end of the line. The mention of our mother must have done the trick. I have no recollection of questioning the message or the messenger. The next morning, we made sure to stand at the back of the line. As we were crossing the street from the orphanage to the church, the two men from the day before appeared, took our hands, and calmly walked away with us. We expected to hear someone yelling for us to come back, but there was no outcry. Somehow, we just walked away. It turns out that the two men had acted in response to a request from our mother. They were members of Lose, a semi-clandestine Jewish organization which helped Jewish children, and which was operating, and still operated, at that time in Vichy, France. To this day, we don't know how my mother had learned where we were, and how our escape was so well engineered. The two men took us for a short train ride and placed us on a farm. However, the farmer did not treat us well and we became very ill. We were malnourished and we had worms and were very sick. We were on this farm for a few months when someone from Rosé came, saw our emaciated condition and proceeded to remove us from the farm and place us in another orphanage in Grenoble. However, Lose refused to divulge our new location to my mother, as Lose was worried that either she would come and visit us and or give away our hiding place if arrested and questioned. So at this point, let me go back and pick up what had happened to my mother. After she uh, came to the apartment and she realized that uh, there was problems, she first found a, a place to stay with a family called Les Parais who worked for the underground. Unfortunately, this, this family, Les Parais, were betrayed by their own son and my mother barely escaped getting caught. She then hid in a convent, but had to leave when her presence became a problem. After having to leave the convent in the summer of nine, in the spring of 1943, my mother was literally walking the streets of Saint Etienne with no place to go. She was at her wit's end. Miraculously, as she was walking, my mother ran into Madame Jean Bonhomme, who owned a dress shop in Saint Etienne, and with whom my mother had established a positive rapport in earlier and better times. When Madame Bonhomme saw my mother, she asked, she asked her, how come she looked so awful? And you can just imagine how my mother looked. At the end of a row, my mother told Madame Bonhomme all her troubles. Without a moment's hesitation, Madame Bonhomme, who was then in her early 30s and recently widowed, courageously offered to help my mother. With total disregard for, for her own welfare, Madame Bonhomme came to the rescue. Madame Bonhomme managed to get my mother a false identity card and a false birth certificate. My mother, who was born in Greiver, Poland, now became Marie L'Héritier. Born in the town of Beaumont, haute loire as attested to by her grandfather, François L'Héritier. An instant and uh, consider the false identity card and the false birth certificate that were issued to my mother. Bear in mind that Madame Bonhomme had to cajole or bribe a government official to get these documents. 
If Madame Bonhomme had been betrayed, this might have caused her her life, as well as the life of the official who subscribed to the document. Madame Bonhomme arranged to my, for my mother to go to work in an honest witness castle for a real marquis who worked with the French for resistance. Shortly after my mother got to the castle, the boarding school where my sister was, Anna was staying were uh, requisitioned by the Germans, putting the children at risk. When my mother told the Marquis, he arranged to have my sister Anna and my cousin Annie come to the castle. As part of taking our family under her wings, Madame Bonhomme, we negotiated with Rosé at my mother's request to learn where we were. Madame Bonhomme came to get us at the orphanage in Grenoble and in the late spring of 1943, she took us and placed us with her mother, Madame Dorel, who we learned to call Mémé and with whom we forged a strong and affectionate bond. La Mémé had a little farm near saint de mont She was an amazing, wonderful individual. And on this picture, you see La Mémé, Henry and me, uh, holding hands with us is Riri, her grandson. On, the, on her left is her daughter, Louisette, who was uh, challenged. And the bottom left is a goat. And our job on the farm, she had a small farm. She was poor, and our job was to take care and help on the farm. Our cover was that one of her daughters had married a Huguenot, and we were Protestants. And that's explained why in the town where 99% of the people were Catholic, we were really not familiar with the uh, what was happening when we would go to church, and why we went to public school. <coughs> we were to two Jewish Protestants, and there was one other Jewish child whose family was hiding, hiding in the town. There are some wonderful stories of La Mille, and I want to share two of them with you. From the time we had left our mother, the only thing that we had learned is Shema. And Henry and I, we would take a Shema, a piece of clothing, cover our head, and we'd say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch, Shem, Kavod, Malchus, Olam, Vayel. We would say it once, we would say it twice, that was our mantra. And we would say it till we fell asleep. I reckon it was 83 times. <laughs> La Mémé, La Mémé, one morning, after a short after I've been in there, he said, what are you boys doing at night? I hear you mumbling, and we had already developed a relationship, and we took her in our confidence. And we told her, Mémé, we say a prayer. And she said, what does it mean? And Henry and I said, we don't know. But the grandeur of that lady, she said, but in any case, why don't you teach it to me, and we will all <coughs> say it together. And you can imagine the scene, the two little guy say, Mimi, répétez, repeat, so my is Another story is that we were going to the public school and they were at best 10 students, the class was a one, one room, room schoolhouse. And we had a wonderful teacher, but who was very demanding, Madame Rochigneau. And she was a total dis disciplinarian. One of us would talk back. And Madame Rochigneau, one they called Henry to the death, and she gave him a slap. I thought his head was going to fall off. And what do, what do you do when somebody does that? 
We took some more. So we got another snack. That afternoon when we came back and we were at the, and we saw, and we spoke to La Bibi, the evidence was there. We had, she asked us what happened. We told her the next morning, the next morning, she came to school with us and she told Madame Rochigneux, on ne touche pas mes enfants. One does not touch my children. We had a protector. There were times when we were with her, when we went to bed hungry. But if we went to bed hungry, good. so did she. Whatever she had, she would share with us. And we came to love this magnificent woman. She's not our biological mother, but to our children and grandchildren who heard our story, she's Mimi Grandma. So, you know, in August of 1943, after we had been with uh, La Mimi for four months, she told us that Madame Bonhomme was going to be taking us to the castle to be reunited, to be reunited with our mother, whom we had not seen in a year. Although traveling involved substantial risk, Madame Bonhomme came to the farm and brought us to the castle. I recall arriving at the castle, and you can see this, uh, the, the photo, 80, 75 years ago it used to seem. I recall arriving at the castle in late morning and hugging my mother and sister. We were given a grand tour of the castle and it was an incredible sight. We then went to eat lunch. We had just finished lunch when the Marquis was informed that he had been denounced and that the uh, German police were on their way to the castle. The Marquis had enough time to arrange for, my, for our whole family to be hidden in the hayloft of, of a nearby farm, and he himself had enough time to uh, escape. That night was memorable because as it became dark, we shared the airspace with bats flying around the hayloft. My mother had to use all her powers to keep us children from crying out. The Marquis contacted Madame Bonhomme, who arrived the next day and took Bunny and me back to her mother's farm. We had been with our mother for less than a day. After that event, my mother had to leave the castle, <coughs> but armed with the false birth certificate and false identity card, she went to work in a, in a nursing home where she managed to survive for several months. After the episode in the castle, Madame Bonhomme took my sister and my cousin to live with her in the back of her uh, dress shop. <coughs> Uh, my sister and my cousin lived with her essentially full time from that point on until the end of the war in 1935. After our return to La Mimi's farm, there was a frightful episode at the end of 1943. There was a Jewish family living in town and they were hidden. They were denounced, and uh, it turns out that the, uh, the, the the police came to arrest to arrest them while we were in school. Madame Rochigneur, the one who loved to hit me, but who must have known that we were Jews, directed us to go home immediately. As we were going down the road, La Mime, who had been alerted, was running towards us, crying and frightened. She explained that there was a problem and that we would be camping out with her in the woods that night. So we spent the night camping in the woods. In the morning, the danger had passed, and we returned to the farm. After that, we continued to live 
with Lame Bay until the end of August 1945, when we were finally reunited with our mother, whom we had not seen in over two years. My sister, Anna, who had been hidden by Tatar Jano since 1943, and had been so thoroughly rehearsed with a cover story that her, that her father was a French prisoner of war, and our sister had gotten to believe this as a gospel truth. As people were coming back, she would skip school and go to the train station, waiting and looking for our father to return. There were prisoners of war and soldiers coming back. However, our father never came back. The, the mystery as to what happened to our father remained, and we received four postcards from our grandmother, my father's mother. She was in, a, in the ghetto in Krakow, and she wrote under the, the, the ghetto was run by the Judenrat, and when letters were sent out, there was the stand of the SS. In the, her letters, she says that our father is nearby, he cannot write, is very worried as to what is happening to us. She also sends another postcard to our sister on, and our sister was going to be nine years old on June, June, January 30th. And she says, please write to your sad grandmother. Now, would you ever write to your grandparent, to your grandchildren, saying your sad grandfather or your sad grandmother? This is, it was telling and touching. Also, we've been challenged by our children on occasions, and they said, your father was very worried about you. What do you think were his thoughts? What was happening with him? Did he think that the same thing would occur to you? In 1946, we came to the United States. My mother, my mother found my sister, my brother, me, and our cousin Jack, whose parents had been deported and murdered. We settled on the Lower East Side. So we somehow we managed and were sent to RJJ, Rabbi Jacob Joseph on the Lower side. We got a education. Uh, subsequently, we went to City College. My brother Henry went on to get engineering degrees and a law degree. I went on to medical school and served in the Air Force. Our sister, Anna, went to Hunter College. But to the great credit of our sister, in 1980, she petitioned the uh, Yad Vashem to have Tatan Jano, a Lame Me recognized as righteous among the nations. And some of us, including Rabbi Thais, were present at the ceremony. The uh, Madame Bonhomme and her mother were found worthy of the honor of being, of being named Raja Gentiles. Madame Bonhomme, accompanied by her grandniece, came from France and she was awarded the medal on July 24, 1980, at a beautiful and dramatic ceremony held at the Israeli consulate in New York. The event by the way, somewhere in my files, I do have the speech that Rabbi Tax made on that occasion. <laughs> anyway, 
The event will duly be reported in the local press and in many Jewish periodicals, including the Jewish Floridian. The story of the award was read by Siegfried Gutter, an 86-year-old man living in North Miami Beach, who himself was a survivor of Auschwitz and Buchenwald, where his, wife, where his first wife had been killed. When Siegfried read the story, he wrote a letter to the Israeli Council in New York seeking to contact us. In Ziggy's words, after I read the article, I got very excited because of strong feeling that in this way I discovered the grandchildren of my late sister, Charlotte Shanza Neguta. I am very excited about it because all my family perished, sisters, brothers, nieces and nephews. I am the only survivor and would be happy to discover from my family somebody alive, even if only in the third generation. My late sister Charlotte perished in 1943-1944 in Krakow from where I received her last letter addressed to me in the concentration camp Auschwitz. You would make an old sick man very happy. The Israeli council contacted us and we set up a phone call with Siegfried. After exchanging hellos, he asked us, was your grandmother's name Charlotte? Indeed it was, and you can imagine the audible gasp in his voice when we told him so. He was exultant. He was crying and laughing at the same time. Ziggy then wrote a second letter to the Israeli Council thanking the Council for completing the connection. And I believe that some of Ziggy's words bear repeating. And this is what he says in Ziggy's words Mrs. Steinberg, that's our sister Anna, and her brothers contacted me by phone and we had a very exciting four-way conversation. They are, in fact, my deceased sister's grandchildren. So after so many years, I had the pleasure to discover some blood relatives when I thought I was the only survivor of my family. As a thank you, my wife pledges to work even harder for the cause of our spiritual homeland Medina Cisroel. Needless to say, we immediately arranged to go with our then entire family to Florida to visit with Ziki and his wife Gisela, who also was a survivor of Auschwitz. Seeing us and getting together brought him great joy and happiness. To appreciate the significance to Ziki of knowing that they were vibrant shoots. Note the Kutta family tree he grew for us the first time we met. And here is his, the oldest brother, Wilhelm, murdered. Samuel, murdered. Charlotte, our grandmother, murdered. Bruno, our father, murdered. Max, our uncle, murdered. Henrietta, murdered. Helen, murdered. Siegfried, the full survivor, Oscar killed, Fanny killed, and Moritz killed. The attempt by the Nazis to destroy the Jewish people has not succeeded, although they have inflicted great harm to us. As you all know, there are two or three million less Jews today than there were in 19. 38, 1940. But in our own small way, we have shown up the Nazi Amulet. And this is the, what we can call, in some sense, the revenge, if you can call it a revenge, of Henry Shanz's family, Bernard Shanz's family, 
and our joint families. And this is our grandnephew, Bella, and Bruno's great grandson, Yonadab, our sister Medalia in 1981. And she died in 1989, but her grandsons and her grandchildren have served in the Israeli army. And it would have made a dramatic difference if Israel would have been present. As last uh, year in April of 1946, I went to Poland on a trip with my grandson, and I met my granddaughter, Ilana Deya. And as we were sitting there, I thought about our trip to Poland. And I don't know if any of you have been to Poland, but it was a beautiful, the weather was beautiful, the grass was green, and we went from town to town where there had been Jewish centers. They were present still, but now they were all museums. And I turned to Jesse at one point and I said, Jesse, do you think that the Germans won? And Jesse's answer was, we are here. But as a, also as part of our story, I want to add something else that happened to us last summer. Two years ago, Henry and I, we started Seven years, several years ago, we started telling our story, and we realized that you had never mentioned or looked into what had happened to the Marquis de Virio. Uh, my mother had been hidden there for six months. He had arranged to, uh, to protect our sister, and we thought that we, it would be appropriate to have them recognized. And, but we didn't know how they would feel. Right now in, in France, you hear about the great amount of anti-Semitism anti that there is. We also, there, there, are, there are aristocracy, because the Marquis, the Marquis, the accounts, the Catholics, would they be interested? And we contacted the son of the Marquis, and he's a man about my age at this point. And when we talked to him, we asked him, we would like to do that, would you be interested? And Wilfried de Virgue, at the first conversation, said, I was waiting for my father to be recognized as a righteous. So we applied to Yad Vashem. We applied to Yad Vashem. And after due diligence, and it's a demanding process, they were recognized as righteous among the nations. Last year, on July 17th, 2016, there was a ceremony in the castle of the, in the castle of Vieru. And they wanted, they wanted to have the affair in the castle. And the castle is an 11th century castle. Louis XIII has slept in that castle. Which you born. <laughs> and in 1943, when we were there, that room was cordoned off. In 2016, that room is still cordoned off. But, but look, on the wall of the castle is the flag of Israel. We were welcomed, and it was an amazing experience for all of us who were there. Because there had been members and the marquee had worked for the French underground, the ceremony started with the song of the French underground. And at the end of the ceremony, we all stood up and we sang the Atikva. This is in France, July 2016. These are, these are three of the children of the marquee. This is the representative of Yad Vashem and this was a member of the Israeli consulate. 
and we took a picture of our family where we had been in the castle in 1943, and this is the De Villiers and the two of us. After the visit, visit to the chateau, we went back as, as part of our, the, of our trip uh, to make up the, our family members, there were 18 of us, to make them suffer a little bit as we had suffered. We offered and we told them we wanted to go back and visit the little town where Bernie and I had lived for two and a half years. <coughs> I didn't quite remember where the school was, so I sent an email to the mayor of the town two weeks before the trip and asked him if he could uh, identify where the school was relative to the little house farm where we had lived with La Meme. The mayor was kind enough to actually call the, the house and after I indicated some hesitation whether we would be coming or not, he said, please come, if not for you, for us. So on the same incredible day, July 17th of 2016, we, 18 members of our family, took the bus from uh, the castle to the town of saint paul de mont We were met at, at the town square with the mayor and about uh, 50 to 70 uh, villagers from the town. They walked us from the town square, three quarters of a mile, to the little farmhouse where we had lived. And it, it had, it had the, the, our, the our house where we used to uh, uh, take care of our needs, has been removed, but otherwise the house is essentially the same. Anyway, we were in the house for about five, ten minutes when the mayor said, we have an unveiling. Bernie and I looked at each other, what kind of an unveiling can you have? Anyway, they had the little red uh, flag put over the, over the sign, and you may not be able to see the sign. But they actually, okay, so they had the town had put this sign and it said, Here were uh, protected or sheltered by Adolphine Dorel, the children Bernard and Henry Schanzer uh, during the Second World War. And the, the person on the right, this is the little boy who was in the picture who Bernie and I were holding on the farm. Anyway, the, the, telling come, the telling thing for us is that following this episode, the, uh, the, the whole, the people with the town, the mayor and us, we walked to the town cemetery. And at the town cemetery, they had a beautiful, uh, at the town cemetery, they had a beautiful ceremony. And for the first time, at least I heard from a French person asking forgiveness for what the Germans had done and what the French collaborators had done. Some final thoughts. In the words of our uncle Siegfried, we must do our utmost for our homeland with the Nazi Israel. And we have to be wary because anti-Semitism has changed its face. It has now become Israel bashing and BDS. This is pure anti-Semitism. For the people who are Holocaust deniers, you can tell them you heard the story and you have to stand in their face and we cannot tolerate that posture. We, more than anybody else, must emulate Catan Jano, Madame Dorel, the Marquis and the Marquis de Virieux. We have to stand up to evil. 
you cannot let evil fall because they're going to, once they get and you let them do what they want, they will cower you and you will not be able to survive. They must be faced and must not be tolerated. When Madame Bonhomme, Jean, Jean Bonhomme, was awarded the plaque as a righteous, she was asked why she had done it. And to her, it was not an extraordinary act. It was what a person was supposed to do. And at that time, she had said that if 70,000 Frenchmen would have hidden one Jew, no Jew from France would have been deported. Another point is that we have to be proud of our heritage. We are a great, great people. We have a very special, special message. And we have to be proud and carry forward. The fear that the Shoah can happen is there. Can it happen again? Yes, it can happen again. So that we need to be vigilant. And it's about you to make sure that it never, never happens again. Ladies and gentlemen, you now understand why we're lucky to be among the wise. I recommend you and your families to continue, to continue to offer sagely wisdom, advice, and to keep answering evil the way you have your entire lives, with chesed, with inspiration, and with the opportunity to make sure that we never forget and we always move forward. May Chayo, El Chayo. Thank you all very much, and thank you, uh, Dr.